Good evening, everyone. I am Yusuf Hashmi from Team Taxman, and I welcome you all to today's live webinar on demystifying PMLA and enforcement actions. But before we proceed, I shall take this opportunity to briefly introduce Taxman. We are India's leading publisher of tax and corporate laws, committed to delivering our users the most authentic and enriching experience. Our goal is to simplify the research and compliance for the legal community. Our unwavering dedication to our vision has driven us to work tirelessly over the past six decades, providing innovative solutions to help our clients grow their tax practices and achieve new heights. And now everyone, please welcome our esteemed speaker, Mr. D.C. Patwari. He's a distinguished IRS officer with a remarkable 36 year career, has extensive experience serving in various capacities within the income tax department, his tenure as principal of CCIT Karnataka and Goa saw the region surpass Delhi to become the second highest tax collection area in the country. He has played an essential role as DGIT and detected the highest concealed income, got the most increased disclosure and ensured the highest seizure of assets in the country. He has also started many best practices in the functioning of the investigation web. His expertise extends beyond taxation as he holds an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and authored a book on stock market derivatives. He is presently uh, the senior advisor with Ruva Advisors and chairman of the Metropolitan Stock Exchange Governing Board. Welcome, Mr. Patwari. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Before we begin, here are a few tips for the audience. Your mic will be on mute during the session. However, you can post your queries in the chat box provided. The speaker will answer your query either during or after the session. A copy of this presentation will be sent to you via email for future references. So without further ado, I would request Mr. Patwari to address the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taxman. And very good evening, everybody. It is really my pleasure to be with you today on such an important topic, which is really having the headline almost every day. Every day we see the newspaper and we see that ED has conducted, seized this much asset, launched prosecution against this in this case. And because of the high profile nature of cases, this has become a routine that these are headlines on day to day basis. So let us try to understand what is the necessity of prevention of money laundering act and what kind of actions enforcement directorate takes in fulfilling this task. So we all are aware that in last 30, 40 years, a lot of development at global level has happened to stop the menace of drug money, terrorist money, and money coming from heinous crimes and different kind of predicate offenses is defined under UN regulations. So a lot of things have happened in the past and we all have major countries have enacted prevention of money laundering acts and that is how now there is a global attempt to stop the money laundering. In fact, all these crimes happens with one of the major objective or key point is to earn illicit money, quick money. And if that is stopped, then probably all those acts will also stop in the long run. So with that objective, it has started. And my uh, presentation is one hour in this. I will be covering the salient features of the PMLA Act and very relevant aspects which are basically required to know everybody should know that and what are the powers and responsibilities and what are the remedies for the people since it is a derivative act in fact it gets the power from the scheduled offenses committed under other act and if that is not there then the pml action cannot survive so it is basically coming from that and it is not just limiting itself to that scheduled offense and the persons involved in that. Anybody who is getting involved in subsequent act of laundering the money by taking the different stages of money laundering, they all are part of it. So that is why it is basically important for everybody to know so that even when we are entering into some transactions, unknowingly, we may end up in the net of PMLA. 
So basic intention is to give an overall view. Now my presentation highlights will be that money laundering is a criminal offense with a minimum imprisonment of three years and maximum of seven years under normal laws and under NDPS, the drug related law, 10 years. Action under PMLA is initiated on committing a scheduled offense under any of 29 acts mentioned in schedule of PMLA. So there are 29 acts under which various provisions of criminal activities are covered under this PMLA, which I will be discussing in subsequent slides. And that will give us an idea as to what are the actions which can lead to PMLA. Because all ill uh, gotten wealth or all black money which is converted into white will not attract PMLA. Only which has a source or connection with scheduled offense is only covered under P PMLA. Then Enforcement Directorate is the investigating agency under PMLA. So the agency which does any investigation under PMLA is in Enforce ED. Apart from criminal liability, proceeds of crime is also confiscated. It is mentioned in the first point that there is imprisonment of three to seven or 10 years. Apart from that, there are the proceeds of crime means whatever money or property generated out of such crime is also subject to confiscation. So there are two liabilities. One is criminal liability. Other one is confiscation of the property. ED can conduct search, seize documents, properties, and also arrest. So ED has a full power to investigate any matter. And for that purpose, they can conduct searches. They can arrest as and when required. Then PMLA has been strengthened over time to comply with FATF review. FATF is basically Financial Action Task Force. That is a global body and which keep reviewing the PM, the prevention of money laundering laws of various countries. And it suggests ways and means to improve the effic efficacy and efficiency of those laws. Burden of proof in PMLA is on accused, which is also affirmed by Honorable Supreme Court. Normal criminal law, there is burden of proof on the investigating agency who are making allegation. But here it is the reverse burden of proof means if any allegation is made on somebody for money laundering, then the person accused has to prove that he has not done money laundering or whatever assets property is in his possession or he has dealt with is not out of tainted money. Scope of PMLA is very wide as it covers even connected persons who are otherwise not involved in criminal act, but involved in financial transactions. Like I'll give you an example that if a 10 crore is involved in corruption matter, bribe, the bribe giver and bribe taker are two people. But subsequent to that, there are 10 other people who are handling that money and then converting that into white or they are involved in money laundering. So all those 10 people who are handling the money subsequently will be covered under PMLA. So it is having a very wide coverage. There are various reporting requirements for financial institutions and intermediaries in PMLA because PMLA is not just an enforcement action. It is also a preventive action where the reporting requirements from banks, financial institutions, intermediaries, and specified businesses and professions are there. I will not be discussing and dealing with that because that itself is a separate subject. But those kind of reports are submitted in the form of suspicious transaction reports, which are disseminated to various investigating agencies. And that is that helps in preventing the PMLA, money laundering. Money laundering, what is money laundering? Money laundering basically refers to the process of converting illegally earned money into legitimate money, black money into white. And it happens in three stages. First stage is placement stage, second is a layering stage, and third stage is integration stage. So in first stage, that is entry of a dirty case or proceeds of crime into financial system. During this placement stage, money launderers are the most vulnerable to being caught. It is a stage like as I gave the example of bribe, 10 crore bribe is given for a particular thing. And that is the stage where a person can be caught. But if that money goes into system like it is it goes in a layering stage where 
those are distributed among less than 5 5 lakh kind of thing and deposited in some bank accounts and then through those money comes back in some form of the other in integration stress to the uh, that person who has done this laundering or who has committed this crime so then this uh, entire money laundering gets completed so three stages first stage is a placement where dirty money is placed in the system and layering where complex transactions are taking place even international movement through export import fdi or many other modes through which the funds are transferred internationally those are also used and primary purpose of this is to separate illicit money from its source the source is where the money is generated and that is separated so this is done by sophisticated layering of financial transactions that obscure the audit trail means even when one will try to find where from the money has come and gone it becomes very difficult because there are complex web of transactions through many companies cell companies many individuals and all those things are involved in this an integration stage is a final stage where money is returned to the criminal from legitimate source like in the form of loan it could be in the form of any 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 kind of uh, money purchase uh, property purchase and all those things because ultimate objective of the criminals under those uh, that scheduled offense is to earn money and they would require to enjoy the fruits of it when it comes back to them so this this is the typical process of money laundering now i talk about the historical perspective how this all happened un convention as i mentioned that 30 40 years back united nations started discussion and passing resolution regarding stopping the narcotics traffic or corruption terrorism activities and for that purpose they identified that money laundering is the main source of proliferation of those activities and if the money laundering is stopped maybe those activities also will get reduced then basel statement of principles in 18 1989 outlined basic policies for banks to follow to assist law enforcement agencies in taking money laundering tackling the money laundering because as i said the money ill gotten wealth get distributed in the system banking system or financial system so if the information relating to that is supplied to the law enforcement agencies then definitely that can be taken in time then fatf that is financial action task force established at the summit of seven nations in paris in 1989 made 40 recommendations giving fundamental material to make prevent money laundering laws in fact that is still existing and they keep reviewing by in the name of peer review and even other kind of reviews on these 40 parameters but these five are very very important these are the cardinal principles of money laundering laws across the globe first is money laundering through serious crime to be criminal offense so not just those criminal offense committed like corruption or drug money or any other law prostitution racket and all those things terrorism those are definitely criminal offense but money generated out of it and laundered should also be a criminal offense that is the first cardinal principle then modalities of disclosure by financial institutions have been made so that there is a information network flowing from the institutions to the law enforcement agencies confiscation of proceeds of crime so this is another principle where the proceeds of crime whatever gen money generated from this has to be stopped and has to be confiscated so that will not create any incentive further money laundering is to be extraditable offense since i mentioned that is a global phenomena and there is a possibility that accused or the person who has committed offense is staying in another country so for trying the for this offense there should be a provision for extradition of such persons so even this will happen has happened in this promoting international cooperation in investigation of money laundering for this the, uh, the request information roi is pro provided in this and international exchange of information and investigations are also conducted so these are the cardinal principles of that then un general assembly resolution in february 90 called for developing law to prevent money laundering so from 90 itself the there was a 
debate and discussion going on and then finally special resolution was passed by un in 1998 in which there was a declaration for combating money laundering and immediately in india also because india is a signatory to this un special resolution of 98 we introduced bill in parliament in august 98 and the bill was sent to standing committee and after that it was introduced finally in 2002 and passed by lok sabha and rajya sabha and president's assent was given in january 2003 and pmla finally came into force from 1st july 2005 when the uh, various uh, modalities etc have been finalized so this is a typical uh, a pmla act it has 10 chapters and just 75 sections but i can tell you with my experience that income tax act has more than 295 sections but this 75 section act is more complicated than even income tax act because many provisions what we have dealt in income tax they are there here but apart from that many new things are here and uh, the scope and has expanded over the period of time so these are the typical sections i will be mainly covering like in the uh, definition part is the prevents uh, that the proceed of crime poc i will be covering then uh, offense of money laundering then attachment adjudication and confiscation then obligation of reporting entities i will not be covering in this because that is done uh, at the end of uh, director fiu financial intelligence unit search and survey i will be discussing then appellate tribunal special court i will be briefly mentioning and then reciprocal arrangement etc so this is total act as such i will not be dealing in great detail here so coming to the offense under pmla so this is the crux of everything all prosecutions as well as confis uh, con uh, confiscation of the property etc starts from this this is the beginning and let us read it carefully person shall be guilty of money laundering when if such person is found to have either directly or indirectly attempted indulge either indulging in this or knowingly assisted even assistance also will be attracting this in one or more of the following processes or activities connected with proceeds of crime because again the offense will be there only when it is connected with proceeds of crime and proceeds of crime i will be defining later which says that proceeds of crime is an outcome or money generated out of scheduled offenses so any kind of money generated from proceed of crime will not be part of this and what are the activities and processes concealment means hiding the proceed of crime is one possession if somebody is keeping possession of ill gotten wealth or money acquisition acquiring that using that in the system projecting as untainted money if somebody is using and product as uh, untainted money or claiming is untainted money so these are the six activities or processes in which if somebody is directly or indirectly indulging or knowingly assisting then he will be guilty of money laundering then process or activity connected with proceeds of crime is a continuing activity and continues till such person is directly or indirectly enjoying the proceeds of crime in the above manner this is very very important this amendment has came has come with effect from 2019 earlier there was a debate whether the pmla or the proceeds of crime is a continuing activity or a one time activity but with this amendment it is made very clear that since the funds generated or uh, in the system is used on continuous basis so till such time that is used the pmla offense continues so even when the proce the proceed of crime is generated say in 2005 but in 2019 it is used in some way or the other then there is a offense committed so this has expanded the scope i think in a very big way proceeds of crime means the property derived by any person as a result of criminal activity related to scheduled offense so this has to be related to scheduled offense and what are scheduled offense because everywhere we have heard that poc or proceeds of crime is out of generated out of scheduled offense what are those so there are three schedules in pmla schedule a mentions 29 acts so offenses on those 29 acts are scheduled act scheduled offenses and any proceeds of crime generated from these 
scheduled offenses will be treated as PM under PMLA. That is Schedule A. Schedule B talks of offenses under Customs Act. That is basically for, for submitting false information and documents. And then Schedule C has offenses with cross border implication. In fact, Schedule A 29X are mentioned. So any of these schedules uh, at 29X has a cross border implication that will be covered under Schedule C. And along with that, willful attempt to evade tax under Black Money Act 2015. So that Black Money Act 2015 is basically foreign asset, unaccounted foreign asset or foreign income. So that is also covered under. So if we see the list of those acts, we will see that GST as well as Income Tax Act are not covered under this schedule of schedule act. Then IPC is a very, very important act under which many provisions are covered at this, under the schedule offenses. I will be discussing this and then other acts I will be just mentioning just for the information of the participants. So section 120B is a criminal conspiracy. Any money generated from criminal conspiracy can be subjected to PMLA. Then next sections are waging war against government of India. That is a very big crime. Offenses relating to counterfeiting of government stamps. We might have heard about that Telgi stamp scam. So that is covered under this kind of provision. Then murder, attempt to murder, attempt to suicide. These are also very heinous crimes. And any proceeds of crime, any, any money generated out of this will be handled under PMLA. Exhort extorting properties and illegal act under section 327-29. Then kidnapping for ransom, extortion, decoity and robbery, stolen properties, related offenses. <clears throat> then Section 417 to 424, cheating and fraudulent removal of property. This is very, very important. 420 is also covered in this. And recently, in last uh, few years, many bank uh, frauds were reported. In fact, CBI action started in those and those has resulted in uh, ED taking action under PMLA also. Because 420 was covered in that based on fraudulent and uh, cheat, uh, wrong information submitted for obtaining loans to the banks. Then forging valuable security, will, etc., and using false property mark and counterfeiting bank and currency notes. So these are typically the sections under Indian Penal Code which are covered under PMLA. So other than these sections, these are they are not covered at the moment under PMLA. Then what are the other acts? Scheduled offense. That is NDPS. This is very very big offense. In fact, the whole thing started with narcotics and drugs. And it was told that at one point of time in America, the uh, more than $500 billion was the kind of money involved in the drug rackets. Then unlawful activities, prevention act, offensive substance act, arms act, immoral traffic act, basically to stop immoral prostitution rackets and all. And very important is Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. This covers all kinds of corruption, including bureaucratic, official corruption, political corruption, everything. So many cases under this act have been booked under PMLA, Explosives Act. Then SEBI Act 1992, two sections are covered in that. That is relating to insider trading and market security market manipulation. So for that, SEBI take action and that will result under PMLA if there is a proceed of crime. Under Companies Act also, which is included very late, Section 447, basically relating to fraud. So that is covered under that. And Customs Act, Duty Evasion and Prohibition and Information Technology Act. Then there are many other acts, Passport Immigration, Foreigners Act, Copyright, Wildlife, Child Labor, Trademark, Environmental Protection Act, Pollution Control Acts, Human Organs Act and Bonded Labor Acts. So, it is possible that in many of these acts, though there was scheduled offense, but PMLA actions have not been taken because either the proceeds of crime must be very small or they could not be clearly identifiable. So what is the proceed of crime? Because everywhere we have seen that any ED action or PMLA action generates out of proceeds of crime. So as per section 21U of PMLA at proceeds of crime means 
any property derived or obtained either directly or indirectly by any person as a result of criminal activity relating to a scheduled offense or the value of such property. So first is where any property derived or obtained directly or indirectly as a result of criminal activity relating to the scheduled offense, which we have just discussed 29 acts and the relevant provisions under those acts or value of such property. If we have not got the money here in India, if it is taken outside or it is held outside, then the equivalent value of the property held in India can also be treated as proceeds of crime. PSC also includes property which may directly or indirectly be derived or obtained as a result of criminal activity relatable to the scheduled offense. Then definition of prevent that proceeds of crime is common to all acts, actions under PMLA, attachment, adjudication and confiscation. These are basically civil actions and prosecution or criminal actions. So definition of that proceeds of crime is same for all. As I mentioned that property involved or generated out of proceeds of crime is attachable and then it can be subsequently confiscated by the court and it can go to central government. So there is a procedure defined section 5 of that is basically for attachment of the property. I will read out the relevant content where ED officer, enforcement director officer of the rank of deputy director and above has reason to believe this is very important because it is not just in any case they will do. They have to have a reason, some reason to believe and that is to be recorded in writing on the basis of material in his possession. So there has to be material, either some FIR or some predicate offense registered or some other information in his possession. Based on that, they have to record reason and then uh, that the person is in possession of the proceeds of crime. And such proceeds of crime means so one aspect is possession of proceeds of crime and other aspect is that he is likely to be, POC is likely to be concealed, means that will be concealed uh, from the authorities and or transferred in some other name or dealt with in any manner which may result in frustrating the proceeding or confiscation of such proceeds of crime. As ultimate objective of proceeds of crime under PMLA is to confiscate such property that is a civil act. And for that purpose, if some transfer, etc., are taken place, then it may frustrate such objective. So, for that purpose, they can provisionally attach a property for 180 days. This is done without giving any opportunity, but there are certain uh, conditions. A complaint or report has been filed in the respect of scheduled offense. This is a general requirement that there should be some complaint or report under scheduled offense so that it can be said that. This is a proceed of crime on particular action. But in a very emergency cases, like the action has to be taken immediately. Otherwise, the money will be siphoned off or taken out and the, it will frustrate the confiscation at later stage. So even without complaint or report also, by recording reasons, it can be provisionally attached. As I said, 180 days. So for counting 180 days, if the matter has gone to the court, high court or somewhere, then whatever time is taken in that, that need to be excluded for counting 180 days. Then to forward a report in a sealed envelope to adjudicating authority. So the officer attaching the property has to forward a report within 30 days. He has to file a complaint also to the adjudicating authority. So this is the procedure as far as the ED officers are concerned. Then comes what happens subsequent to that. So there is a authority called adjudicating authority which sits in Delhi and they will actually act on the complaints received from the ED as far as the provisional attachment is concerned. On receipt of complaint from ED officer, if adjudicating authority has reason to believe that a person has committed offense under section 3, that is there are two things. First is offense committed under three or is in possession of proceeds of crime. Even if he has not committed offense, but he is still in possession of the POC, then he shall serve a notice, not giving not less than 30 days, calling him. Certain details are called by educated authority. These are source of his income, earnings and assets out of which he acquired the attached property. If the property is attached, if the person who is on the record owner, if he is 
having the genuine source of it, then he can very well submit those documents to the uh, educating authority and get the release order passed by that. If property is held by the person on behalf of other persons or jointly with other persons, it could be the person is holding A is holding property on behalf of B or it is jointly held with A and B together. Then in that case, the 30 days notice which adjudicating authority will give will be issued to all so that everyone get, will get an opportunity to represent. After considering all facts and replies, adjudicating authority will pass an order whether all or part of the property is involved in money laundering or not. So after like giving opportunity, examining all facts and everything, adjudicating authority will pass an order based on that, whether the entire property is involved in money laundering or not. And what can the outcome? If A decide that the property is involved in money laundering, he will confirm that attachment. He finds the entire property belong to proceeds of crime and it is involved in money laundering, then he will confirm that attachment. Once he confirms the attachment, the attachment will continue from that date till 365 days, one year. Like if attachment is made today, con confirmed today by adjudicated authority, then till next year, 4th September, it will continue. In between, if the complaint is filed, prosecution complaint is filed in the special court, then attachment will continue till the special court finally decides the criminal offense of that. Where provisional attachment is confirmed, ED sale take possession of the property forthwith. Here, it is not just a simple attachment. The moment it is confirmed, ED sell take the possession of the property so that the person who is involved in the proceeds of crime in scheduled offense will not enjoy the benefits of the property. So it will be taken. It is a possibility that at final stage, the special court might held the, acquit the uh, accused and he may get it back. But then in the intervening period also, ED takes possession and take control of it. On conclusion of trial, if special court finds that the offense of money laundering has been committed, then it shall pass confiscation order to the central government. So if it is found that the offense has been committed, then property will be confiscated and the order to this effect will be passed and property will belong to central government, which it will manage, which are there in section 9 and 10. Or if it is found that it is not a money laundering property, then it will release the order. Of course, against the order of uh, special court, the appeal can be filed both either side in high court and then subsequently to honorable Supreme Court. So this was about the attachment and then how the enforcement directorate conducts action. So it has many provisions. First is survey. It can conduct survey. Any authority on the basis of material in its possession has reason to believe to be recorded in writing that an offense under section 3 has been committed. Then he may enter. So first, before entering any place for survey, they have to have a material in the possession. And based on that material, they should conclude, they should have a reason to believe and those reason to believe has to be recorded in writing that offense under section 3 has been committed, which that is basically uh, offense under money law of money laundering. If that is done, then he may enter a place within his area or if other authority has authorized him, then in that area and person available at that time or owner or the employee, whoever is there of that place has to afford the facility to inspect records. They can check and verify the proceeds of crime and they can provide any other information relevant for that. After completion of survey, copy of regions recorded with material in possession to be sent to the adjudicated authority in sealed envelope. So under PMLA, whatever actions are taken by the ED, they have to prepare the regions recorded, material, etc. Everything should be in the sealed cover and that sealed cover is to be sent to the adjudicating authority who are not supposed to open it, but they will preserve it for 10 years. And those would be as, as and when required in the further court proceedings. Officer can place mark of identification on records, make an inventory of any property and record statement of the person. So all these are possibilities under survey. 
these are like uh, what we do under income tax act also then search and seizure by enforcement directed so that is another important power under section 17 and 18 of uh, pmla search can be authorized by director ed or any other officer from deputy director or above however the permission from the joint director is taken on record and the basis of information in possession to be recorded in writing there are four situations in which search can take place any of the four first is has committed an act which constituted money laundering if there is a reason to believe that a person has constituted an act which falls under the section 3 of pmla then one can authorize search then in possession of proceeds of crime if there is a satisfaction that proceeds of crime is kept by somebody then on that premise or with the person the search can be authorized or in possession of a record relating to money laundering there is a possibility that the person may not have the physical property or asset but he may be having the records relating to money laundering so in that case also the search can take place or in possession of any property related to crime there is a possibility that person may uh, have a, in possession property related to crime so in these four situations director or any officer from deputy director and above by recording the regions in writing based on the information in each position can authorize search in search what authorized officer can do he can enter and search the building he can break open any door or lock he can seize any property or record found he can also place mark of identification on such records also make inventory of records or property and examine the person on oath so all these powers which are there under income tax act also as far as entering the premise searching breaking open identification seizing the records and properties making inventory and all those things are done to ed under section 17 and 18 in case of the personal search if a property cannot be seized due to its size like some properties are very big and physically it cannot be seized then ed can freeze it and it will be treated as deemed seizure as it is there in income tax act also officer to forward a copy of regions recorded with material in possession to adjudicating authority after search so all these material based on which the search has been authorized has to be put in the sealed envelope and that is to be sent to adjudicating authority who is supposed to keep those records for 10 years and if the pro certain proceedings like in the criminal court or high court or supreme court the matter is going on then even for the per further period beyond 10 years also it can be kept authority seizing records or property to file an application within period of 30 days for retention of such property or record to appropriate authority adjudicating authority so in this case also as we have seen in the case of uh, uh, that uh, uh, property attachment provisional attachment of the property within 30 days they are supposed to send to the adjudicating authority here also whatever property has been seized or the record seized for retention beyond 30 days the same has to be sent to the adjudicating authority who will pass order as we discussed earlier again for 365 days and if uh, that uh, prop, uh, the complaint is filed in the special court then it will continue till the special court order is passed in any if any person has secreted about his person or things under his position ownership control or record or proceed of crime he can be searched by ed and record and property can be seized so the same thing which is done for the premise this can be done with the to person also searches will be conducted in presence of two witnesses this is very important because no ed search like income tax searches will take place without the two independent witnesses so this is in general the searches and uh, procedure of seizure ed has a power of arrest also director deputy director additional director or special director are empowered to arrest under section 19 of the pmla that arrest can be done only after the approval on file from special director before arrest reason to believe 
to be recorded in writing based on the material in his possession. So that is again requirement. ECIR that is enforcement case information report is to be prepared wherever any arrest is made. The person should be guilty of offense punishable under PMLA. This is a requirement because if person is not guilty of offense under punishable under PMLA, then arrest cannot be made. To inform the person the ground of arrest immediately, the copy of ECIR, ECIR is not given, which is a which is considered as a confidential document, and it has been affirmed by Honorable Supreme Court in the case of recent case of Vijay Chaudhary that uh, ECIR is not like FIR filed by the police in CRPC, so that need not be given to the accused immediately. Then immediately after arrest, forward a copy of order along with material and ECIR to adjudicated authority in a sealed cover envelope. So whatever actions are being taken by ED, as we mentioned, whether it is attachment of the property, survey, search and seizure or arrest, they have to prepare the documents and put it in a sealed cover and that is to be sent to the adjudicated authority immediately after the action is completed. And that is supposed to be kept for 10 years or subsequent period if it is required for any proceedings pending. Person arrested will be taken to special court or judicial magistrate within 24 hours. So that is the requirement which is there in the case of other criminal actions, also criminal arrest under CRPC. So the same thing is there. And for counting 24 hours, the period spent in transit has to be excluded. Safeguards. What are the safeguards? There have been claims that uh, the powers are very wide and vast and there is no safeguard. So the matter has been discussed in Honorable Supreme Court in the matter of, in the case of Vijay Chaudhary and Honorable Solicitor General mentioned these arguments that power of arrest is to only high ranking officers, that uh, it cannot be authorized unless special director authorizes it, approves it. So there are only five in numbers. So very high ranking officers applies their mind. Incriminating material against accused a must. That is a requirement because unless a person is guilty of offense under PMLA, he cannot be arrested. The reasons to believe based on the material that person arrested is guilty. That is also a requirement. Reason to be recorded in writing. Then reasons must be sent in a sealed envelope to the neutral adjudicating authority who preserve it without opening for 10 years. Accused must be informed grounds of arrest then arrested person to be produced before magistrate within 24 hours. So all these are the precautions. And apart from that, the bail, of course, uh, can be considered by a special court and then appeal against that can be filed in high court and honorable Supreme Court. And there are certain categories of cases where bail can be granted, which are uh, like a person below 16 years is infirm, sick, woman or where the proceed of crime is less than one crore. Otherwise, the there are conditions under which the bail can be granted. Those are little stringent because these are non-bailable and cognizable offense. And the responsibility under section 45 is cast on the accused to prove that he was not prima facie guilty of PM, under PMLA offense. And once he is released on bail, he will not be doing any further offense. So these are about the arrest and the power. Then legal remedies, this is, I think, very important slide. So as I mentioned, there are two kinds, kinds of action, rather three with arrest. So against the attachment, seizure, and possession of the property, any order is made. The first stage is adjudicating authority. Against that order, if the person is not satisfied, one can go to appellate tribunal and from there, honorable high court and Supreme Court. So that is regarding the civil matters. Against the arrest, special court can definitely deal with it. Otherwise, Honorable High Court and Supreme Court. And against the prosecution and resultant confiscation of the property, special court and then High Court and Supreme Court. So these are the stages of legal remedies. Then I will be discussing with some relevant posers to explain the provisions of PMLA and in specific situations. So first is, is there, is it, a, is it necessary to obtain magistrate's prior approval before making arrest? Magistrate's prior, prior approval is not required. 
Now, only the approval of a special director is required. That too, not in the act, but uh, administrative mechanism. Is possession of unaccounted money considered as a proceed of crime? As I mentioned earlier, all unaccounted money will not be proceeds of crime. Only those unaccounted money which are generated from scheduled offenses will be considered as a PRC proceed of crime. So if there is some black money generated from tax evasion or from GST violations, it will not be treated as POP, uh, proceed of crime under PMLA. Is offense in PMLA expanded by explanation to clarify that it is continuing offense, retrospective or prospective? By amending the law to make PMLA offense continuing offense, definitely scope has expanded because now when we hold that the money is still being used by the accused or the person handling uh, money laundering, any, any time that use continues, that uh, provision can expand. It will not end when the integration of the money laundering is over. So even without making it retrospective, it is used, uh, it, it, it expands the scope. The next question is, can property involved in the commission of scheduled offense be considered a proceed of crime? Property involved in the commission of offense will not be proceeds of crime because proceeds of crime are generated after the offense is committed. So in this case, like in the case of murder, where a car is used or a pistol is used in commissioning of the scheduled offense, these are not proceeds of crime. Each property that is derived indirectly or through further transactions carried out with proceeds of crime considered as proceeds of crime. Definitely, because if the proceeds of crime are used for doing further transactions, that will also become proceeds of crime. And definitely that will be covered under PMLA. Will the offense of money laundering be triggered only upon the laundering of money? Is the act preventive or penal? Can the giver of a bribe be prosecuted? There are three questions in this. The first answer to the first question is that it does not trigger only on the laundering of money. It is a continuous offense. So even if it is used subsequently, it can be triggered. Is it a preventive act or penal? Most of the provisions are penal in nature, but chapter four is basically where the informations are submitted to the director IFU, where this is a preventive because those can identify the cases and that will stop money laundering activities. Can the giver of a bribe be prosecuted for? Giver of bribe actually is involved in the crime, but once he gives the bribe, then that is handled by the bribe taker and the subsequent people. So as far as the giver of bribe is concerned, he will not be a part of, uh, he will not be tre treated as a uh, uh, person accused under PMLA because he will not be dealing with proceeds of crime. Do the rules of investigation applicable to police agencies under CRPC applies to ED under PMLA? So it has been mentioned that uh, whatever provisions of CRPC are applicable for ED actions also under PMLA, to the extent those are not contradictory. So there are certain things like FIR copies to be given, but in the case of ED, that ECIR copy need not be given. Similarly, the statement given under uh, that uh, section 50 of PMLA is having evidentiary value, which is not there in the case of police. Are accused person fundamental rights violated by burden of proof placed on them by PMLA? Courts have held that there is no violation of fundamental rights. Is money laundering a standalone offense? Yes, money laundering is a standalone offense. It has nothing to do with the person only involved in the criminal offense. Like, let me give an example. If a person is involved in corruption and there are subsequent stages where people are handling that money and converting that from black to white. So all those people are otherwise not involved in the corruption, but they become accused under PMLA. So PMLA is a standalone offense even, but of course the origin has to be 
a predicate offense or a scheduled offense. But once that is done, then it becomes standalone offense. And the new people, new accused can come in that. Does the ability to use statement of the accused recorded by ED violate the right against self-incrimination? It has been discussed and debated in the court and even at the stage of Honorable Supreme Court, it is held that it doesn't violate the basic fundamental right because when the statements are recorded, the allegations are not proved or accepted. So these are basically finding of the facts and for finding of the facts, it will not violate the fundamental rights. Can PMLA be applied to act when which were prior to enactment of PMLA? So the criminal act under a scheduled offense, scheduled act, if it is done prior to that, but the money laundering happening later, then it can be applied. Is ECIR, that is enforcement case information report, which is prepared as a confidential report by ED, is akin to FIR, needs to be given to the accused under PMLA? No, it is not to be given and it has been now categorically held by Honorable Supreme Court that ECIR copy need not be given to the accused. Whether property acquired prior to enactment of PMLA, that is 1-7-2005 can be attached. So property acquired prior to that also can be attached because if it is continuous, it is a continuous offense and if it is used subsequently, then it can be attached. Can the absence of proceeds of crime absolve the offender from punishment under PMLA? If the proceeds of crime have generated, but those were consumed or transferred or shifted and ED, can, ED is not able to find the proceeds of crime, they can still be punished under the prosecution under PMLA because there are two sides, one is civil and criminal. If civil offense, uh, that uh, there is no POC, then that cannot be confiscated, but punishment can still happen. But if there is no generation of POC from that offense, then that is not possible. Like in the case of, like I can say, suicide, attempt to suicide is a part of this. Obviously, there is no generation of proceed of crime in that. So, even if it is a criminal act, there may not be any possibility of PMLA in that case. Do reporting entity have any civil or criminal liability under PMLA for reporting, non-reporting or misreporting? Reporting entity is supposed to report to director IFU and they don't have any civil or criminal liability, but fine can be levied for non-reporting or misreporting by director IFU. Whether quashing of a case of scheduled offense shall automatically result in subsequent quashing of PMLA cases. Yes, quashing of a scheduled offense will automatically result in quashing of PMLA cases. It has been held by Honorable Supreme Court last year in the case of Vijay Chaudhary. So I think that is final. At what stage property attached is proceeds of crime be confiscated and possession taken by ED? Proceeds of crime is first attached and then that is confirmed by adjudicating authority as I discussed. At that stage, possession can be taken by ED if it is confirmed by adjudicating authority. But confiscation can be made only when the final order is passed by special court. That is equivalent to uh, that is session court, the undesignated court. So if they pass the order and uh, upheld the, uh, that uh, uh, PMLA offense, then confiscation can be done. What will happen to the attached property after conclusion of trial? For the offense of money laundering. After conclusion of the trial, there can be two situations. If the property is held as a POC and PMLA offense is upheld, then it will go for confiscation and go to central government. And if it is held to be not part of POC and uh, PMLA offense is not true, then it will be released to the person from whom it is attached and seized. Is there any time limit for disposal of appeal by the adjudicated authority? Act does not have any time limit, but it clearly says that any order passed by uh, ED will be only applicable till 180 days, provisional attachment order. So within 180 days, the adjudicated authority has to pass order confirming or rejecting the attachment. In a scheduled offense where there is no POC, there is no proceed of crime, can ED still proceed against accused under PMLA? When there is no POC, then ED cannot proceed because 
PMLA starts with proceeds of crime. Anybody dealing in proceeds of crime, the basic condition itself will not be fulfilled. There are some crimes like some murders or some uh, criminal act taking place for the motives other than money. So in that case, the POC may not be there. Can money generated from offense of betting or other prohibited act be treated as POC under PMLA? As we discussed that, that proceeds of crime has to be from the scheduled offense. Since betting is not a scheduled offense and if other prohibited acts are under any schedule, then only it will be treated as POC under PMLA, otherwise not. Is there any minimum monetary limit before initiating action under PMLA? There is no monetary limit now. Earlier, there used to be 30 lakhs for Schedule B offenses. Now that all offenses have come to Schedule A, where there is no time limit. A person has taken accommodation entries for purchasing property. Can he be subjected to PMLA proceedings? If the property is purchased out of tented money, then yes, it can be. But those accommodation entries are not coming from the proceeds of crime then it will not be subjected to PMLA proceedings. Can money acquired through violation of GST law be treated as POC and can action? Since GST law and Income Tax Act are not part of scheduled offenses as discussed earlier, so any violation under these act will not be treated as POC under PMLA. Can conviction of FEMA, the violation of FEMA and possession of unaccounted foreign exchange lead to action under PMLA. Since FEMA and possession of unaccounted foreign exchange is not mentioned as an offense under schedule ABC, it will not be part of PMLA. Which matters under PMLA are dealt with by special court and which others by adjudicated authority in PMLA. Basically, criminal matters are dealt with special court and civil matters relating to the Con, uh, that uh, attachment of the property, seizure of the property, etc., are dealt with by adjudicated or PMLA tribunal. Can prosecution for money laundering offense be filled, filed by the special court even before filing of charge sheet in the scheduled offense? Yes, prosecution can be filed because there is no barrier in that. The next is can trial in money laundering offense be concluded before decision in scheduled offense by special court? Trial cannot be concluded because scheduled offense are the basis for PMLA offense. So before that, the trial cannot be concluded. Is it mandatory that a person convicted in scheduled offense has to be convicted in PMLA offense also? No, this is not mandatory. The observation of A can be used, but that is not final. Then can properties of relatives or associates be attached, confiscated in PMLA only when those are proceeds of crime. Otherwise, their property cannot be attached and confiscated. Whether the findings or decision of AA tribunal are binding on special court, not at all. They can use it, but not necessarily. Is it necessary to issue notice to the accused before making provisional attachment? No, there is no necessity. The notice is issued by adjudic and authority at the stage of confirmation of that order. At what stage attached property can be released by A and tribunal or special court? It can be released while deciding the confirmation of that and while finally deciding the prosecution case by special court. Is burden of proof different in criminal law in section 24 of PMLA? Yes, it is different because in criminal law, it is basically a burden of proof is on the investigating agency who are alleging a particular offense. As far as in PMLA, it is on the accused to prove that what is alleged is not true. What is lookout circular? Lookout circular is issued for against the person who are suspected to flee the country and investigating agencies are issuing those in appropriate cases and generally court do not examine the relevancy of that. Is there any approval required before making arrest under 19? That is only uh, no other permission but special director's permission may be required. What is the validity of statement recorded by ED? It is fully valid. And retraction that has to be proved with contemporary evidences, then only it can be retracted. Otherwise, statement will have full validity. Can search or survey be conducted at the premise of CA advocate, etc.? If they are keeping the records of offense, PMLA, offense documents or proceeds of crime, then it can be done, otherwise not. Can the validity of search conducted by ED be challenged in writ proceeding? Yes, it can be challenged. It has been done, but in most of the cases, it was not successful. 
what happens in the court which has taken cognizance of serial offenses other than special court because now pml offenses are tried by special court if other court is there uh, that is trying the serial offense nowadays it is advised or rather uh, the um, transfer of those matters are taken place to the special court so both the uh, offenses and serial offense as well as pml offense are tried by the same court can ED investigate connected scheduled offense? Not at all. ED is only empowered to investigate PMLA offense. Scheduled offenses are to be investigated by relevant agency, police, SEBI, or whatever uh, act they are administering. Can a writ petition be admitted at the stage of issue of summon under section 50? At the issue of stage of issue of summon, no uh, writ can be admitted because there was no uh, violation at that stage. So these are uh, some of the posers I thought I will discuss. Now I think uh, I need to look at the question answers which I, I would like to answer. Yeah, there is one question. Oh. Uh, is I have already crossed the time. Uh, can I continue with the question answer or? Surely, sir, if there are any remaining questions, you may answer. Please. Okay, I can answer now. Okay. Uh, these are. If a business sells its product in a normal course and all compliance, the recipient of the product say page in check and RTGS, but originally the money may have been from a dirty source, then will it will the seller will have a liability of any sort? Yes, initially, prima facie, if the money from the dirty source has come, then definitely initial allegation can be there, but then if everything is bona fide and uh, they have taken precaution to identify and due verification is done then probably in the stage of adjudicatory authority and uh, subsequent stage it can be released proceeding under pmla was initiated by registering ecir against abc on the basis of scheduled offense ed filed complaint case under 45 of pmla against a and b only whether the ecir still stands against c or not Subsequently, the scheduled offense again A and B sold, C got quest. So, as per the Vijay Chaudhary, three sold with no offense and money laundering against ABC. Now, what act should be taken by ABC as well as C to ensure that they are free from? Yeah, as per the Supreme Court decision Vijay Chaudhary, there is once the scheduled offense is decided against or rather is quest then there cannot be any PMLA offense. So I don't think anything need to be done subsequently. They have to simply claim before the authority and special court to release the procedure uh, that uh, whatever POC uh, or properties have been attached. In a legally enforceable commercial contract, if one outside of the party is subject to certain CBI or ED proceeding and the other party acted innocent and received the funds, and spent in the normal course of business as revenue expenses. Can ED attach the asset of the other innocent party? How an innocent party can come to know and do due diligence before entering into such contract? Definitely, there will be an issue in that because the fund is directly coming from the party who has committed a scheduled offense. Then definitely, the uh, the ED will make inquiry into that, and the bona fide can be proved in basically either court or educational authority and attachment provisional can be made by ED, ED based on the reason to believe that funds have flown from the proceeds of crime. But ultimately, yes, there is a possibility, but two things need to be proved. One is that the person who is the bona fide transaction is not aware of all these things and he has taken due diligence while doing the transaction. If he happened to know the ED and CBI action, and still conducting the transaction, then I think the knowingly involved involvement will come and it is difficult to get any, any relief in that. 
Vijay Chaudhary case study, that is a very landmark decision and uh, agent where it was required, I have used, but uh, definitely that is at the moment the uh, landmark decision, which is there as far as all actions of ED, whether what they have done is correct or not, and what are the potential uh, actions they can take in what kind of cases and what are the possible reliefs for the uh, accused. The next question is, uh, where was a fire accident in a private hospital? An FIR was lodged against the owner and subsequently ED also stepped in. In this case, how can it be possible and there is no POC? So, there has to be a scheduled offense. So, first one has to see what is there in FIR, whether that is covered in any of those IPC provisions I have discussed. If it is part of that and somebody has actually that fire is put by somebody and against that some money has been paid, then there can be a case of POC. If it is a simple accident, then probably nothing will happen. But if it is some kind of a conspiracy or some external factors have worked for it and it is a scheduled offense, then definitely in that situation ED can come. So we have to see all the facts and then probably I think uh, something can be considered here. I think I have answered all questions. I'm now stopping the screen share and going back to you, Textman. All right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Patwari, for your outstanding presentation and a clear and concise explanation of the subject matter. We greatly appreciate the effort that you've put into making this session a success. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the participants for their cooperation and contributions. We could not have done it without you. Although we have attempted to address all the queries raised during this session, please feel free to reach us at sales at taxman.com. Thank you all again. We look forward to presenting another vital topic to you soon. Thank Until you. Then, Thank you so much. Take care and have a wonderful time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.